Sir, I'm uh, really excited about uh, this interview and to uh, talk a little bit about the book and uh, see if we can get the word out. And thank you so much for your expertise and uh, just your network of influence and uh, taking the time to put on these kinds of, of um, interviews. Oh, yeah. Yep, definitely. Definitely. And go ahead and have a word of prayer, then we could get started. I like that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you now. Thank you for Mark and his friendship and his ministry, Lord. And I just admire him for his faith and for how he's just stepping out of the boat and just trusting you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that your hand would be continued upon him and bless him and his ministry and his family. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, hey, Mark, why don't we start by you sharing a little bit about yourself? Uh, God, thank you so much, Scott. appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, speak with you and to share with your listeners. Um, I am um, a pastor in the Church of Nazarene and a church planter. Uh, my wife, Valerie, uh, works for Michigan State University from home. I have two sons, uh, Brian and Kyle, and three grandchildren. Uh, their mother is uh, Ren, Kyle's wife, and uh, the third one is actually due in about a month. So I'm very happy mm -hmm. as a grandfather. And uh, uh, God has called me uh, to uh, reach out to um, emerging adults, 18 through 34 on secular university campuses. And so we're relocating in the process right now uh, to Knoxville, Tennessee. Awesome. And, that's amazing. I'm uh, yeah. right in the middle of writing a book. Yeah, and that's God's providence too. And, you know, I was thinking too, you know, with the revival infecting all these universities and colleges and how timely is your research findings? Well, it really is humbling to think that uh, my, uh, God might use uh, the research that I've done as a piece of the puzzle for what he was already planning Sovereign to do uh, across our uh, university campuses and colleges, uh, both private and secular. And so there's just some really providential um, uh, confirmation of uh, what he had been talking to me about a year ago and what um, I've been studying for the last uh, three or four years with Asbury Theological Seminary and my doctorate of ministry degree for focused on church planting. So uh, yes, I'm very, very excited about it. And uh, this really does kind of go to the juggler vein of the issue of our day. And uh, I'm really excited about being able to share it. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I've had some you know, conversations with you before and you know about God's time and God's providence and all of this too. And, you know, your book title sounds really interesting. How is your new book different than, let's say, other books that talk about evangelism and disciple making and church planning? Because there's a whole boatload of books out there on these very same topics. I often talk to my friends and my Asbury advisors that we don't need another book written. <laughs> there is plenty <laughs> of resources out there. But what I find is that these resources have little pieces of the puzzle and little uh, ideas, but being able to re to connect them and recombine them into a, a more up-to-date strategy and understanding of where uh, the spiritual climate is in the uh, in Western civilization, I think is what makes this uh, book uh, very unique in its uh, contemporary offering. It's entitled actually, Missional Hope, Unlocking receptivity in the narcissistic West. And so as I hear reports of uh, the Asbury uh, revival or outpouring as they're calling it here in 2023, and I watch the reaction of people around me like at uh, camp meetings or in public events, whenever uh, people are hearing about the news of the revival among our emerging adults, what's kind of interesting is that they, uh, they appear to be more dazed than amazed and almost to the point of, of not really believing their ears or not really registering that we might have something going on that doesn't, um, that doesn't uh, read into the narrative that we have kind of adopted since uh, the 1960s with Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth. And, and that, that, that narrative goes like this. Um, and I know 
there are many, many different ways that people uh, uh, view this. But the idea is that things are going to get worse and worse and worse. There's going to be a great falling away. All that is true. But what's absent in this is this more post-millennial um, optimistic view of what Jesus talked about is that there would be this great um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days and uh, a massive world evangelization that takes place. And that is missional hope that uh, this book really speaks to. And I'm really excited about what kind of, of help it might give those that are in the middle of this revival that are thinking about, okay, what do we do when uh, we get through the first stage of this um, great awakening? How do we help it, help God, join God in what he's doing so that it can win even more people uh, to Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. That that sounds like a wonderful book and a book that's you know, really needed in today's culture, and especially in today's time. And I know you shared with me, you know, at the buzz when we were at the coffee shop about, you know, your evangelism strategy and how it's different, like how it was like 20 years ago, where you would just go knock on every door and pass out tracks and maybe you could speak to the viewers about that and what you share with me at the buzz. Yeah, sure. So if anybody that is in the church today that is uh, trying to uh, present a winsome witness to uh, to influence people spiritually around them, they're finding a great amount of resistance. It's harder than ever today to be able to invite someone to church and for them to actually come. Mm -hmm. uh, I estimate, I, I've also often estimated that you need to issue 100 invitations to someone that is irreligious or who's done with church before they'll actually come. And that's exhausting. It really is. Yeah. Just, uh, and what I'm finding is that people are, really resistant to sales approaches anything that smacks of them being sold something and uh, and i think that the church has kind of gotten used to this idea that it has to be attractional in other words you have to be basically uh, a debutante at a ball uh to look very very attractive and to and in, in very extreme uh, uh situations uh i think that some church leaders even uh, lead their church into something that feels a little bit like prostitution, that we're basically mm -hmm. willing to sell everything about ourselves and compromise who we are in order to get some attention, you know, yeah. and to get some following, uh, instead of it being more of a game of hide and seek. <laughs> and the parables of Jesus in uh, John 15 talk about the lost um, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And this idea that the great shepherd is actually going away from the fold and out into the risks of, of finding and reclaiming a lost sheep that is strayed. And so the way of Jesus appears in the Gospels of being a seeking God who is leaving where he is to go where the lost are. Mm -hmm. And if the church is going to be following the way of Jesus, we uh, cannot afford or expect that we would just sit and wait for people to come into the front doors of our, of our church buildings. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, young people, they could smell when you're not being real a mile away when you're being fake and you're not being very authentic in your presentation of the gospel too, so. Absolutely, and it's it, and you're right, it's very critical for the perpetual age of 18 through 34, that journey that um, adolescents are beginning to, uh, to make in their journey to full adulthood. And what's kind of interesting about this is that the world has really, really changed, especially in Western civilization across the last 140 years, Scott. And I speak to this in my book, is that Back in, uh, 140 years ago, right around the Civil War period, once you became a child became 12 years old, they were ushered into a rite of passage into adulthood, full adulthood. And at the same time, they were maturing, uh, going through puberty much, much later than uh, children are today. Uh, they were going through puberty around age 15 or 16, both men and women. Hmm. 
today, children go through puberty starting even as early as age eight. And there's some biological and environmental reasons for that, nutritional reasons for that. Uh, but we'll not go into that. But uh, around the, the turn of the century, this idea of there being adolescents, in other words, uh, more ch uh, children were going uh, to secondary education, um, delaying entering the workforce, um, and then going on to college or vocational school. And mm -hmm. so that adolescent age was actually created in our uh, culture to wrap around the puberty and the awakening of, of conceptual thinking in children. Mm -hmm. And so that's where youth ministry got started was because they were addressing this new phenomenon of adolescence. But then at age 18 or at age 21, when they got through the school, then they were fully adult. And that's the rite of passage. Today, we actually have a new category uh, that's been created called emerging adult. Mm -hmm. And um, Arnett talks about this. He's the one that, that emerged, uh, that, um, that created, coined the term emerging adult, ages 18 through 29. That's actually been extended to 34 now. And it is this delayed entrance into full adulthood. So mm -hmm. that not only are they trying to get through college and then maybe master's work or doctoral work, uh, uh, to the place where they're getting married a lot later and having children a lot later, that many adults are really taking a lot of time to weave their way to full adulthood, sometimes even boomeranging back home. Yeah. So this has caused a, a, a psychological, a social psychological uh, category that we didn't have to deal with back whenever the church was basically sitting back waiting for uh, the people to come in once they'd open their doors, all right? Mm -hmm. And so that's been one thing that has caused a different situation that the church has, has encountered in the past. And then there are some th theological reasons for this. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, you know, how would you say that we got to this place for, with the dominance of shame? And what would you say to a leader who is really struggling in their church to encourage them to have that hope? Scott, that's a great question. And uh, the book really kind of assumes, it doesn't have in the title, that that we're dealing with a different spiritual dynamic that's dominant today than we were back in uh, Martin Luther's time. If you're a member in church history, world history, is that the Middle Ages were a time of people feeling um, their mortality very keenly. You, you had the plagues, you had a lot of wars going on back then, and people died early. So people were naturally thinking about their destiny, heaven or hell, are they going to go, mm -hmm. all right? And so it was, a, it was a, um, a time in civilization where people were dominantly thinking in terms of guilt and innocence. What is my responsibility for the sin that I am committing? And how can I be forgiven for that? How can I be reconciled with God? Well, that uh, the Protestant Reformation um, uh, imprinted on the culture of that time and that that spiritual dynamic, so that um, the gospel presentations, the way of sharing the gospel, basically uh, uh, solidified around a theory of the atonement called penal substitution, mm -hmm. uh, where God, uh, as judge, uh, condemns our sin, but because of Jesus, he forgives us because Jesus pays the price. Jesus takes our place. And so gospel presentation started with the sin, the fall of Adam and Eve and the sin, and then gave a solution to that through the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. What's missing from that story is part one and part four, which is creation and restoration. Mm -hmm. Now that the spiritual dynamic has changed to shame and, and honor or glory, now people are not responding to the old way of delivering the message based upon penal substitution, talking about sin and redemption. They now need to hear the whole story. They need to hear about how we are created in the image of God and that what is home for us is being home with God and created the way that he, he 
um, he intended for us to be before sin infected us and caused us to become less than the humans that we were created to be. And how the, the fall sets into motion some very dehumanizing things that Jesus solves by becoming human and by showing how God the Father restores our humanity through to us, both instantaneously and progressively uh, until um, we arrive in heaven at death's door. So uh, I think it's really kind of interesting that now we need to kind of update the way that we approach people as well as the way that we share the gospel. So what this book does is it helps us to understand how we can engage emerging adults right where they're at in the midst of their impact by shame dominantly and how to do that with more confidence. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be based upon really not just simply talking about relationship, but learning once again, how do you relate to someone of a different generation? particularly an older uh, middle adult or, or senior adults, how do they uh, bridge that gap of being able to relate with some very educated, technologically sophisticated um, young adults who may be single, who may be married, who may be married with children or married without children or not married with children. And that are very industrious. They don't have a lot of time to be at, at a church every time the doors are open. And how to understand that what they present to us is not necessarily who they truly are. People do not present their heart today. Mm -hmm. They present to us their wall. And so it's important to understand what those self-defense mechanisms are that's motivated by the sense of shame, of unworthiness, of pride that sometimes comes across as shamelessness. And how to help those people to lower their walls and so you can get to their heart. Because that's the way of Jesus, of getting to the heart. So this book talks about how leaders are doing that now and gives a starting point for a, a, church, a leader of a church, perhaps one that's struggling because they're finding that their church is pretty outreach sterile. Um, who are frustrated by the fact that their uh, average age of their congregation keeps on getting higher and higher, 60s, 70s, 80s even. And just the bewilderment about how we can get to the hearts of these young people. Hmm. That's the missional hope that this book will uh, address. Yeah, that's really, really good and something that's needed today. And, you know, you know, culture and everything has changed, especially since COVID. And uh, so what's the official title of your book and when is well, it going to be first available? The uh, title as it stands right now is Missional Hope and subtitled as Unlocking Receptivity in the Narcissistic West. And uh, I'm deep into the writing of it right now, uh, Scott, and I'm also in the middle of, of packing and relocating from Florida to Knoxville. So I'm optimistically thinking first of June. I'm more realistically thinking August first. So <laughs> awesome! It will take some time. We'll see how things go, and um, appreciate your prayers for this. I'm really excited about it, and I just want you to, to understand that um, this is not the um, answer to everything. This is just a piece of the puzzle by recombining uh, best practices and a, a more fresh uh, theological understanding of of original image of original sin and how Jesus as our victor conquers shame as well as sin. It's a well, very that sounds excellent. And I'm looking forward to reading it. And you know, I'm going to want an autograph copy from you too. So. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, the responses that, um, that people might uh, have to this book. And certainly hope that it would stimulate others to build upon um, this research and uh, that was from my doctoral dissertation, uh, How Shame Shapes Church Planting, and, um, and that it just uh, sets the stage for um, a full spiritual awakening that is already in process by God's sovereign will. Awesome. Wonderful. So is there a way that the viewers can follow you? 
uh, and follow along the process with absolutely. So, so uh, I would like to invite you uh, to uh, the Breakthrough Equipping Network Facebook page. That's Breakthrough One Word Equipping okay. Network, and uh, most of the information about the book is going to be on that uh, that web page. And uh, but but your viewers can also uh, email me if they would like. And this is kind of a long uh, email <laughs> address. R M A R K, that's Mark Montgomery, M O N T G O N E R Y dot M M, that's Mary Mary at gmail.com. And I'll awesome. And I'll put that information on the description of this video and in the comments for everybody to have for a reference. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good. And uh, yeah. I'm just uh, really anticipating what God is doing these days. And I'm still learning. And um, as I go to Knoxville and uh, engaging students on the University of Tennessee's Knoxville campus, I'm actually um, applying what I know and what I'm learning and for the sake of their souls and for Christ's sake as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Mark, for joining us. And I'm looking forward to hear how God moves in your midst. Thank you, Scott. And God bless you and all that, that God's uh, got uh, calling you to do these days. Thank you. God bless you. All right. All right. Thank you.